And of course, Brett Graham was your sous chef and you helped him to set up the Lebri. Um, yeah, I mean, Brett, Brett, um, Brett came to Square as a, as, a, as a young lad and, um, you know, he, it was very obvious very early on that he was an incredibly good cook. You know, he's got, you know, he, 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 was, he, was, he was bloody hard work, actually, Brett, because he's so passionate. And he's so, you know, you get to point in your career when you're 15 years down the line where actually the most important thing in the afternoon is to get the hell out of the restaurant. And yet for Brett, that, that time slot was right. I want to do a special tonight. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? And you're just like, Brett, I just want to go out, actually. <laughs> Don't want to talk about food anymore. He's a great cook. You know, it was clear then that he was a great cook. And, and um, I suppose I had no, no, never had any intentions of, of opening another restaurant. Um, and then you get something like Brett along and, and you realize that actually um, we got on incredibly well. I think our palates, uh, as, as you know, the detail of, of, of cooking, we related incredibly well. Um, and to be perfectly selfish about it, you think, well, here's somebody that I could imagine working with. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him an opportunity and he's going to be my pension. <laughs> And, um, and, and that's kind of, that's, 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 that was the deal of the Ledbury. So it was never a case of going to be Philip Howard in Notting Hill Gate. Yeah. It was always going to be independent restaurant. Yeah. Yes, we gave him bucket loads of support in the early days, but it was always his restaurant, um, his menu. You know, it was, it was so do you, have, do you have to do anything to support him now, or do you just uh, bank, no, we, bank we, the checks? No, no, I mean, really, now, not for a long time. I have, no, I have, I have absolutely nothing to do with, um, I mean, we speak a lot. He's my, you know, he's a great mate. And but you we, still have your shareholding? Oh, yeah, so absolutely, he's absolutely a partner. Um, no, but Brett, um, he's, he's, he is, he has complete control. I mean, Nigel's a bit more involved with the restaurant because he has the time and the desire, actually. Um, and he brings something to it. You know, he has, he, Nigel's, he is, he has he has something to bring to, to the lobby that that that, that I don't in, in some ways. Um, Brett uh, Brett actually his cooking has quietly progressed over the years and is now the the, the heart and soul of it's still similar to to, the, to to what to my style of cooking. But he has become a, his own his own man in terms of cooking. So I don't. Um, we we talk we talk as mates, not as not as and, and not really not often as business partners. And then, of course, um, you got involved with uh, restaurateur Rebecca Mascarenas and opened. Yeah, Re Rebecca is somebody WA. who um, I knew because from from where I live, she has a she has a restaurant that I'm now involved with too, um, just around the corner from home, um, and we'd always sort of got on. She had a restaurant um, site in Kensington that she was sort of thinking about what to do with, having closed one, one business there. <clears throat> so she approached me. What I've come to, to realize is that all I really get my fulfillment out of, the thing that I enjoy doing most is cooking. And it's always been really important that I, I, I do not get involved with things that are gonna pull me away from that. Otherwise you just end up busy and miserable. And as much as she, she wanted a partner, I've always thought very carefully about the opportunities that have sort of have come my way to think, okay, how's this going to fit into my life? Was there, a, you know, how's it going to work? What's, what's the impact on my day-to-day -day life going to be? How am I going to be, how, what have I got to bring to this thing? How am I going to make that happen without it becoming a nightmare? And, and the truth was that I had home is here, Ledbury is here, Square is here. Kitchen W8 was, was right on that path, so it means I could just stop in if I had to. And Kitchen W8 is a restaurant that I've been much more involved with than the Ledbury, um, because that was what I always intended to do. I mean, now I have to say how many years down the line. It runs <coughs> day-to-day basis without any, any contribution, but I still meet every week and we still, I play a part. Rebecca's a phenomenal businesswoman. Um, I've always, uh, if I can get to the end of my career, having just been left alone to do the things that I enjoy, then, then I think that's quite successful. I don't enjoy the, 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 the business side of it. It's not what, I don't have any natural, I know I understand it, but it's not my thing. <clears throat> and I think for a, for a chef to have, I think it's so important that they have two things in their life. One is a business partner, somebody who can make sure that their cooking skills actually make some money at the end of the day and keep a, keep a restaurant afloat. And two, somebody who might be the same person, um, but not necessarily somebody who can tell them, 
give them some honest opinion on, on what they're doing because us chefs, we don't like criticism and we tend to think what we, you just need, chefs need somebody in their life who can say, do you know what, that dish is crap. <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 you know, because we get, we get caught up, some more than others, but we all get caught up on the process of cooking. We get off on how we get from A to B. We take this whole thing with slow cooking, that you've got to cook your piece of veal at 62.3 degrees. I mean, it's a fuck, that's a joke. It's all a joke. You know, that, that, that whole world is a joke. That the temperatures to that level is, it's a joke. But chefs get off on it. They get off on, what does the tree look like when I slice it? Well, you know, what is, you know, we, we, we get off on the process of cooking. And if that's what makes us passionate and that's important. Customer doesn't give a shit how you got from A to B because he only gets B. <laughs> and they just give a shit what B tastes like. Yeah. And if it looks nice, well, hey, that's fantastic too. Yeah. And, um, and the problem is we put things on the menu that we think are clever and, and were cool to make and were cooked at a cool temperature and look cool when you slice them. And, um, and that's why you need somebody to say, do you know what? The truth is those lovely ingredients that you just pressed into that fucking terrine and chilled to four degrees would actually have been much nicer as a salad because then they're room temperature and you can cook them fresh and they're delicious. And, um, and, and it's important. And, and um, I think there's some great, great, great cooks out there and great craftsmen who've never chosen to or allowed somebody to kind of to play that role in their life. And, and, um, and I had, you know, not, I, as much as I trained under some great chefs, it's my business partner who, who played that role in my, in my career, who made me see that it's really important how delicious something is and to not get caught up in the, in the cleverness of the cooking process. Having been asked dozens of times to do a book, you decide to do an epic yeah. book, which you hand wrote? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I agreed to do the book years and years ago, and eventually, originally, it was supposed to come out on our 10th anniversary, and um, I think it came out on, I don't know, the 21st or something, so it took, it was a long time coming. Um, and um, I don't know, what do I think about the book? Somehow, the pain of writing it still uh, dominates the sort of, the fulfillment of, of doing it in a way. You, and I looked at White Heat, I just thought, what a great book, yeah. what a great book. And I look at, this, look at the book that I wrote, and I just thought, it's just so, it is a great book, you know, the, 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 the square cookbooks, the two, the two books, because they are, I decided if I was going to write a book, I think most of the, of the high-end Michelin books, you, you, if you want to try and cook complex food, you have to have a picture. You have to know where you're going, I think. And um, so that was the, f and that writes out, writes off most publishers. They're not interested. The cost of having a photograph for every dish is just too much. So um, that was that was a problem along the way. And until Absolute Press came along, they they agreed to to, to do that. Um, and nine times out of ten, even if you have got a picture in the book, the 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 text, the ingredients, and the methodology, there's never enough information in there. For anybody at home to even begin to try and achieve the, the picture, and I thought, well, what's the, what's, the, what's the point in that? If you read a sentence that says, uh, take two 1.6 kilo chickens, debone them, and use them to line a terrine, full stop. Well, you know, that's really easy for a chef to write, but it's for somebody at home to, 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 to it does, it, that's just hopeless. Yet, to write how to debone a chicken, is, is, a, is a massive undertaking, you know, and, and, and that kind of, that was, that was how I was gonna do it. So I decided that if I'm gonna write a cookbook, I want it to be absolutely thorough. So that genuinely, anybody who's got some cooking skills can pick that thing up and there is enough information to have a good stab at, at delivering the end result. Um, and so it just became incredibly kind of long-winded. But the truth is, in the end, it, you know, it, it was written and, um, the whole thing got handwritten. I've still got the original manuscript, which is sort of A4, about this high of the, the, the savoury. And, um, and my, the vast majority of it was typed up on a Blackberry at the reception at the square and then emailed across to the editor. He then... So it was a beast, but it is... I'm proud of them. I think that the truth was the, 
the square deserved a cookbook, and um, that was really the, the motivating factor behind it. But there's no two ways about it. If I was to look at the hours that I spent writing the cookbook <coughs> and to look at the, 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 the checks that have come from the publisher, that is the least productive <laughs> time I've spent by a long shot. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's hopeless. Are you obsessive about things? Are you obsessive about the detail of that? And is that your personality? No, I don't know. I think it's funny because I don't, I don't, think, I, I don't think I am in a way um, because I'm not, I'm not sort of in, in the way that my last head chef was or where, um, or Marco was, where they can't not comment on, on everything that's not 100% perfect is, is an issue. So in that sense, I'm not sort of, I think in order to enjoy life and in, to enjoy, enjoy my job, I'm really pretty much happy if everything is 2% imperfect because yes, some, lots of things that come up in the kitchen are just spot on. But I, I'm not phased if they are just off perfect because the headache that that last 2% causes is just, it's just no fun at all. And, um, and you could say, well, that's a bit slack and maybe that's why we don't have three stars, but that's also why I'm happy and still cooking 25 <coughs> years down the line and not burnt out and miserable. Well, on that note, thank you very much for being so open with us today and, and giving pleasure. your time. And um, yeah, thank you very much, Phil. Thank you very much.